Well, I'm delighted to be able to uh, share with you tonight after a splendid dinner. I must apologize. I, I just have no pregnant monkeys <laughs> on a raft to show you. But I'll do my best. As I speak on the subject of living with the great divide. Now, I know what it is to be sneered at in the secular academy, and it's unpleasant. Sneered at not because I'd been academically incompetent, but because I had revealed my religious faith. When I told my history professor at the University of Sydney that I was going to train for the ministry, he sneered, well, I guess you can write a parish history of some something or other. Funnily enough, his last name was Angel. <laughs> but that was far from an angelic response. Maybe you two know the experience of which I speak. So I really feel for the marginalised Christian scholar or researcher who feels the odd person out. As William Paley, the subject of my doctoral research, wrote in the 18th century, who can refute a sneer? He had that influential critic of Christianity, Edward Gibbon, in mind. Houston Smith had a similar experience of being marginalised at MIT. He was a teacher of philosophy there and he fell into conversation with a scientist. They talked about their respective disciplines. The scientist announced that he could see the difference between them. He said to Smith, I count, and you don't. <laughs> so here are some uh, ruminations expressing my attempt at some conceptual clarifications and my attempt to address some pastoral concerns with them. Which brings us to the Great Divide. The Great Divide is between those who have a supernatural orientation and those that don't. Years ago now, Harry Blamires wrote a classic on the Christian mind and one of its defining characteristics, he argued, is, quote unquote, its supernatural orientation. However, such an orientation places the Christian in a millennia's old conflict. Now, philosopher William Halverson captures the nature of the conflict for us, and I quote in extenso, a particular view of the whole of reality through which one attempts to understand everything that comes before one's consciousness is called a worldview. The constructive task of philosophy, then, can be described as the quest for an adequate worldview. The problems of philosophy are the problems that arise as one pursues this quest. It may be helpful to bear in mind from the beginning, however, that one theme that underlies nearly all philosophical discussion is the perpetual conflict between naturalistic and non-naturalistic worldviews. A naturalistic worldview is one in which it is affirmed that A, there is only one order of reality. B, this one order of reality consists entirely of objects and events occurring in space and time. And C, this one order of reality is completely self-dependent and self-operative. He goes on, according to philosophical naturalism, a complete knowledge of the physical universe would constitute a complete knowledge of the whole of reality. Any worldview that denies any of the above stated tenets of naturalism then may be termed non-naturalistic. Thus a worldview affirming that human beings possess a mind or soul that is something other than a physical entity or affirming that the entire physical universe is dependent for its existence on a God who is not himself a part of that universe is non-naturalistic. He elaborates, the perpetual conflict between the naturalistic and non-naturalistic worldviews explains in part why philosophers sometimes defend so vehemently their views on what may appear to be relatively trivial matters. Indeed, because every philosophical question is related to, in one way or another, to the quest for an adequate worldview. No philosophical question is ultimately trivial, he writes. Every philosophical problem is, so to speak, a test case. Our whole worldview, the entire system of beliefs by which we attempt to understand the complex array of data coming before our consciousness, is always at stake. 
Well, of course, a supernaturalist worldview is a non-naturalistic one, and in the academy and in the laboratory, it is the naturalistic worldview that is in the ascendant. So let's turn our attention to naturalism. I want to talk about naturalism and methodological atheism. The ascendancy of naturalism has affected methodology, and so concomitantly, we have methodological naturalism and methodological atheism. This is how Douglas V. Papora captures that reality. Naturalism is the assumption that all scientific explanation must be this worldly, never referencing supernatural or transcendental realities. One way of preserving naturalism is the methodological atheism first articulated by Peter Berger. Methodological atheism is the practice of bracketing or refusing to consider for the purpose of sociological study, the ultimate reality of such religious objects as God, angels, or cosmic unity. Now, my contention is that many a Christian finds that, that at work, their espoused theology, which is supernaturalist, is felt to be in conflict, if they think about it at all, with their operational philosophy, which is naturalistic. This can lead to a compartmentalization which leaves Sunday, church, disconnected from Monday, work. So I can envisage a scientist who work in the laboratory in a reflective moment, experiencing marginality in the lab, put another way. Belief in the Trinity is part and parcel of his or her liturgical experience on Sunday, but the concept of the Trinity plays no explanatory role in theory formation or scientific practice on the Monday. Uh, Thomas Nagel, an eminent secular philosopher, states the problem well. But among scientists and philosophers who do express views about the natural order as a whole, reductive materialism is widely assumed to be the only serious possibility. Uh, did you hear that? The only serious possibility. An even earlier philosopher, Bertrand Russell, was adamant, and I'm quoting, what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Uh, believing in Christ in a working environment dominated by such a temper can be a very lonely place. So out of pastoral concern, may I ask, how may such marginality be lived with? Is there a way forward? I believe there is along the following lines. I want to talk about a fresh frame of reference involving two principles. I would argue that what is needed is a fresh frame of reference that is driven by principle rather than mere pragmatism. Uh, let's think about methodological naturalism once more to highlight the need for a fresh frame of reference. Kirsten Burkett, who is here, one of our conferees, describes methodological naturalism in these admirably clear words. There is also what is known as methodological naturalism. Others would say methodological atheism. This is a mode of doing, say, scientific experiments, assuming that uh, whatever natural phenomenon is being studied will have a natural explanation. It leaves unasked and unanswered questions about ultimate explanations, and is frequently the heuristic used by theistic scientists in their day-to-day -day scientific work. It is in many ways a misleading term, as the scientists may believe firmly that God is entirely responsible for the natural activity being studied, but the scientist is just not interested in that question at the moment. As we will see, she writes, there are various historical reasons for why many Christians take this approach to the natural world, assuming that natural events have natural causes, even if ultimately the overall cause is God. It's a very different position from what we are calling naturalism in this essay. The metaphysical position that the natural world as opposed to any supernatural world is the only thing that exists, she writes. So in the light of that, I want to talk about the principle of methodological subsidiarity. Now, Burkett is right to us that methodological naturalism is in many ways a misleading term. You know, words really do matter. We've been wrestling over words today, haven't we? Words like um, mytho-historical, saga, um, linear, um, lineality, and things of that nature. 
In many ways, it's a misleading term. Why? I think because it can smuggle in a metaphysical stance. For example, reductive materialism. So let me suggest this instead, the principle of methodological subsidiarity. But what exactly is subsidiarity? Well, here's how the Cambridge Dictionary puts it. The principle that decisions should always be taken at the lowest possible level or closest to where they will have their effect. For example, in a local area rather than for a whole country. Adopting this principle affects expectations. The idea is not new. Listen to this insight from Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, 3. The educated man looks for as much precision in each subject as the nature of the subject allows. It's, for example, much the same to allow a mathematician to argue persuasively as to demand rigorous proof from an orator. Now, I'm no scientist, but I know a little about writing history. I've published in the areas of 16th century history, Thomas Cranmer, and 18th century history, William Paley. In writing about the past, for example, the 18th century, my focal awareness was on William Paley. My subsidiary awareness was on divine providence. It was my focal awareness that was represented on the page. Now, this distinction between focal and subsidiary awareness comes from Michael Polanyi. It's easily illustrated. Take the word awareness, which I hope is on the screen. Uh, when you see it on the screen, I'd imagine everyone here would think in terms of the meaning of the word. It's a kind of knowledge. A subsidiary interest is in the letters making up the word. But if I asked what letters make up the word, then your awareness would switch. The letters are now the focal interest and the meaning the subsidiary one. In the lab, for argument's sake, my focal awareness may be of the chemical reaction that I'm observing, not the doctrine of creation. That concept is in the background. The principle of proximity to the anthropological. Uh, the principle of proximity to the anthropological is a subject I've written about elsewhere, and I'm going to quote myself here. Every discipline presupposes some doctrine of the human. In some disciplines, that doctrine is very much on the surface and potential conflict between the Christian and others will be more to the fore. One might suggest that there is a principle of proximity to the anthropological. For example, my theological anthropology is not to the fore when considering symbolic logic. But if my discipline is biology, psychology, sociology, or anthropology, then the conflict between my worldview and that, to say, of a reductive materialist would be to the fore. The concept of Imago Dei simply plays no explanatory role in the secular domain. And with the conflict comes the need to be epistemologically more sophisticated by understanding the role of presuppositions in any claim to know. And hard questions may just have to be lived with. And living with cognitive tensions may remain the reality in the discipline that is my workaday life. We should not be surprised by any of this as the social imaginary has changed, as Charles Taylor has taught us to recognise. Culturally speaking, the onus to justify truth claims has shifted and not in the believer's favour. Indeed, a, a Christian anthropology with its entailments for sexual expression is a point of increasing conflict in the wider culture and not just in the secular academy. What then? Let me suggest the need for an AFL box. I taught philosophy for many years, and that is one discipline that raises acute questions addressed to faith and its viability. And often I didn't have much of an answer. So I constructed an AFL box in my mind and in my journal. What am I talking about? AFL stands for awaiting further light. <laughs> uh, let me offer a case in point. Why is the universe so vast if the main game is on this one tiny planet? Is this just human hubris? Well, look, I did develop an answer over time that was value-based. There's intellectual value, truth in contradistinction to falsehood. There's moral value, 
good in contradistinction to evil. And there is aesthetic value, beauty in contradistinction to ugliness. Is this universe so vast because its vastness, in its vastness there is aesthetic value that the creator enjoys? Some years later I taught a, a, co-taught a seminar with John Polkinghorne at Monash University in Australia. He was Professor of Mathematical Physics at the University of Cambridge for many years and became at a later stage in his life a trained theologian. He explained that if the universe were not as vast as it is, then the elements that make up our bodies would not have been forged in the stars. Now I had a second answer to my long-standing question. Who knows, if I live long enough, I may have three or four altogether. <laughs> Some of us are in disciplines where we will have to live with questions and the cognitive dissonance that they create. Over time, some will be answered, some never will. I've yet to find a satisfactory theodicy, which convinces me that it has uncovered the, the reason why a good God has allowed evils, natural and moral, to exist. I can offer a defence of sorts, which argues that I can provide good moral reasons for believing that God has good moral reasons for allowing evils to exist, but not a theodicy, strictly speaking. That brings me to the need for epistemic humility. The fact is that not everything has been revealed as Moses made clear to Israel, gathered on the plains of Moab, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our, to our children forever, that we may follow all the works of this law. It seems to me that the mosaic insight should affect the matter of our expectations. Uh, for example, who uses a road atlas to look for phone numbers? But some appeal to scripture as though it offers an encyclopedic worldview that addresses every issue and academic discipline, whereas I would argue that scripture presents an existential worldview, but with implications for an encyclopedic one, which is always open to revision and evinces a humble provisionality. Why do I say that? I think our expectations need to reckon with the non-postulational nature of scripture. Pope Leo XIII and Bernard Ram, and not often you'd see those two names together in one sentence, offer helpful insights here. Pope Leo XIII in Providentissimus Deus wrote these wise words about a century ago, 1893 actually. To understand how just is the rule here formulated, we must remember first that the sacred writers, or to speak more accurately, the Holy Ghost, who spoke by them did not intend to teach men these things. That is to say, the essential nature of the things of the visible universe. Things in no way profitable unto salvation. Hence they did not seek to penetrate the secrets of nature, but rather described and dealt with things in more or less figurative language, or in terms which were commonly used at the time, and which in many instances are in daily use at this day, even by the most eminent men of science. Now I might just uh, depart from my notes for a moment at this point. We rightly uh, work with the descriptor of God as creator in a Debar conference. But I wonder if there's a missing descriptor of God, one that pervades Old and New Testament. God the teacher. Any teacher knows how to go up and down the gears to communicate with people in their setting. And evangelical theologian Bernard Ram offers us this astute observation, his Christian view of science and scripture. The science is dated, but the general approach is still valuable, I believe. He writes, the language of the Bible is non-postulational with reference to natural things. By this we mean that the Bible, he says, does not theorise as to the actual nature of things. Now his point can be easily seen if you contrast Genesis 1 with Plato's Timaeus. And when I teach uh, the doctrine of creation uh, to theological students, I, Genesis 1, of course, and other texts, the Enuma Elish, and Plato's Timaeus as points of contrast. Genesis 1, we read, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. <clears throat> And so God's work week begins in a way any Israelite might understand. Uh, six days on and one day off. In contradistinction, in Plato's To Me As We Read, in the first place then, as is evident to all, fire and earth and water and air are bodies, and every sort of body possesses solidity, and every solid must necessarily be contained in planes. And every plane, rectilinear, rectilinear figure is composed of triangles. And all triangles are originally of two kinds, both of which are made up of one right and two acute angles. One of them has at either end of the base, the half of a divided right angle having equal sides, while in the other, the right angle is divided into unequal parts having unequal sides. Plato's Timaeus is postulational literature. Genesis 1 is not. Working with the secular other. Although not with the scientist in mind, but quarrelling theologians, theologian Roger Nicole offers uh, some very helpful guidelines for working with those with whom we disagree. Three questions animate his approach. First, what do we owe to the person who differs from me? Two, what can I learn from those who differ from me? Three, how can I cope with those who differ from me? With regard to question one, we owe love. We're to love our neighbours, we're to love our enemies. Matthew 5, 43 to 45. Love will show itself at the very least in being swift to hear the other slow to speak and slow to get angry. James 1.19. Question two evidences the wisdom which knows that we need others to inform and challenge us at times. We can get things wrong. We can articulate our point of view poorly. I read somewhere that the Christian may have many teachers but ought to have only one master. I resonate with that. As I mentioned earlier, I taught philosophy for many years and I learned much from Plato and Ludwig Wittgenstein. Neither is my master. Coping with those who differ from us, say in our secular work situation, when the issue is discipline specific, is something that Nicole does not treat. But let me suggest the following. We need to be able to show that we know the history of our area of inquiry. It's presupposition, methods, current schools of thought. And our own work should evince the highest standards that we're capable of. If there is a scandal about our worldview, let it not be because we do shoddy work. What Nicole offers is a way in which presuppositional, let alone moral, strangers may meet civilly. Now, living with the Great Divide. Now, let me review what I've been saying. Philosopher William Halverson argues that the great divide in Western thought is between those with a naturalistic worldview and those who have a non-naturalistic worldview. For those who practice science, naturalism dominates the work environment. This is especially challenging for the Christian who experiences marginality as a result. That sense of marginality may be exacerbated by unrealistic expectations as to the degree to which our faith and professional discipline may be integrated. Living as we do outside of Eden, amidst brokenness. This presentation has offered a frame of reference involving two principles, a way forward to a deeper understanding of what our expectations ought to be, the principle of methodological subsidiarity and the principle of proximity to the anthropological. The principle of methodological subsidiarity relieves me of the pressure of feeling that I have to tie everything that I think or write to my faith stance in every instance. That would be a theologia or philosophia gloriae. The principle of proximity to the anthropological makes me completely aware that I may be working in an area of human inquiry where my view of the human may elicit searching questions from colleagues of a very different persuasion and that I need to be prepared for them. Answers to some questions may come over time. To other questions, we may never have a satisfying answer. 
Having some device like an AFL box awaiting further light can be a practical way to help us live with questions. So if I asked how I'd describe myself as an historian, I would say that I'm a metaphysical theist and a methodological subsidiarist. If you want to put a nuance in it, I'm a metaphysical theistic personalist and a methodological subsidiarist. I'm suggesting that this may be a useful distinction for the believing research scientist and the believing academic as well. I've also argued that in the pursuit of wisdom, epistemic humility is needful. Further, adopting the protocol suggested by Roger Nicole may provide practical ways to live and work with the secular other. Finally, as that great theologian Clint Eastwood <laughs> remarked in the movie Dirty Harry, a man's got to know his limitations. And come to think of it, so do our various disciplines with the scientific, biblical, theological, or philosophical. Thank you. <laughs>